Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, Fading Memories listeners. Once again, I appreciate you choosing our podcast for your listening and inspirational pleasure. Once again with me today is Ian Tolson, the host of the Successful Solutions podcast. Ooh, that's a lot of S's to say. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for joining me, Ian. (laughs) My pleasure, Jennifer. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me on. You're, You're welcome. So Ian's podcast is basically on how to develop habits and making actions your greatest habit. And we're going to chat today about how we can maybe change some habits to make our caregiving a little bit easier. So it's a little bit of a challenge for him because this is slightly outside his norm, but I know he can handle it. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, Ian, because I know you have gone through some interesting challenges in your life, which led you to what you're doing now. Yeah. So to start, I was put on a drug at a fairly young age before my teen years. And it everything was fine before I was put on the drug. And the drug was seen as this great solution that was going to help me with school. And there was multiple parental figures and other adults, doctors that were supporting this idea. And after I was put on the drug, things went pretty far south for me, just in terms of mentally, my appetite decreased pretty dramatically to the point where my parents were saying, you need to eat something. And I was just like, I'm just not, not hungry, you know? And I got pretty irritable. I got snappy. I became an antagonistic with people more or less. And I was fairly difficult to deal with and what, what I feel like. And I was also having subtle memory problems things that I could very easily remember before became more difficult, even having conversations where I would ask how the person's day was going. I'd quickly forget what they said within about 30 seconds. And I would start re-asking the same questions. Information comprehension became very hard. And it was like, I didn't have access to my memory anymore. So that was before I was entering my teen years and then going, and then when, when I ride around the, the time that I entered those years, I had to figure out that I needed to get off the drug and I needed to start changing my eating habits because the thing I realized going through school was that I was put on this drug simply because I was just being a little bit too hyperactive in class, you know? And so I knew that the the drugs weren't the solution. The problem that I was actually experiencing is I was I wasn't eating good enough food. And I think this relates to someone's audi- your audience as well because if they're drinking soda and processed foods and uh, anything with that converts into sugar, I have noticed that after I stopped taking just sugar and, and, and we're talking in the form of breads, grains, potatoes, peppers, salsa, corn, tortilla chips. If you're, if you just take out all the things that turn into sugar, because all of those things I just mentioned, when you consume them, your body uses it as a form of sugar, including corn and things like that. So when you remove the corn, what, what you're actually doing is you're getting rid of all this inflammation. And that was something that helped me tremendously when I started getting into a better stage of eating. And I don't want to make someone think that you have to stop eating all of those foods right now or anything, but I definitely would recommend pushing yourself to the point of like, okay, instead of eating corn chips, I'm going to go eat celery or something like that. Instead of a soda, I'm going to have a sparkling water or something that will be okay. I'd say fruit is definitely okay in that realm of things. But um, after I went through this, this developing period for probably 20 years, where I was basically having a difficult time just remembering things and, and getting in these bad disagreements with people where it was turning into arguments, I had to transition my life over. And I did that with a supplement that really helped my mind completely. It was like I had access to my memory again. 
And I was then able, I don't know if anybody's ever had that experience where they, they, they go into a room looking for something and they completely forget why they're there. Uh, I don't have that anymore. And in fact, I can remember pretty quickly what it is that I was looking for. And this is going from the state of forgetting what somebody else had said within 30 seconds to being able to have a very full conversation with another person. And then getting also to the point where this has more recently happened. If there's a confusion about what's being said, I can pinpoint what the confusion is in in the conversation just based off of their reaction or what they had said in relation to what I had said. So it's a very large difference in comparison to before. And it's I'm very grateful to be able to even be at that point because I have been striving for this for more than 20 years. You know, I when I was going through that entire phase, I was always knew that I could outperform where I was at and that I was frustrated with myself, as I'm sure elderly people get as well when they get to the point where they're like, I can't remember. And it's, it's irritating me that I'm having these memory problems because I shouldn't, I'm, I'm better than this. And I think it's hard for everybody because when you get to the point where like, I mean, I saw it in my grandmother when they're forgetting who you are, it's really hard. And the thing that I learned is that when it comes to someone quote unquote, losing their memory, they're not actually losing their memory, they're losing access to their memory. It's not that they are forgetting, it's that that they can't access the memories anymore. And the supplement that I'm, I'm mentioning has one for one, anyone who takes it for a long enough time frame, I've always seen someone get a result off of it. And so it's, I just, the only reason why I mention it is because anyone who's elderly and they're starting to lose their memory and things like that, this is like an ideal thing in combination with reducing things that process sugars and grains, pasta, rice, potatoes, that kind of stuff too. I don't know if we talked about this when we were planning this episode, but my mom mm. drank two liters of Diet Coke a day. Mm. My dad was a terrible eater from, mm. I think, birth on. He was very happy with a fried hamburger patty, mashed potatoes, and corn or peas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you're you're getting inflammation just listening to me describe this i'm sure yeah. they had um they ate a lot of bologna american cheese which mm. i swear tastes like plastic i don't even know I think why it anybody, has plastic in it <laughs> it probably does it's i mean it's 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 just not tasty enough to bother with you know it's like mm. it's fattening it's you know it's just there's really not a lot of redeeming qualities and then after my mom had Alzheimer's and lost the executive function ability to cook, which, you know, you'd think after, let's see, she was in her 60s. You'd think after, you know, 50 years of cooking and, and making meals for her siblings and then our family that, you know, that would just be like muscle memory almost. But it's really interesting when you stop and realize how many steps are involved in just making a simple sandwich a lot of steps, you know, it's easy to get lost. My dad took over and oh my God, the boxed food and oh yeah, yeah, it was just, ugh. it makes me, it makes me feel cruddy just thinking about what was in their pantry and the mm. refrigerator and I'm not even sure what kind of fresh fruit they had. Now that I think about it, it's been five years since my dad passed away, getting closer to six couple years since mom passed away when she was in the memory care residence, they ate really well and the food was really good. And it was, you know, like low sodium. Mm. I don't, mm, I think it was pretty balanced. I mean, the portions were pretty small. They were mm. very right sized for an older adult who wasn't super active. They were a little small for me, but not horrible. You know, they, they were kind of goal worthy for most lunches. Like this is a good portion size. Even though sometimes they were, they felt a little lacking, but so you also came up with, you've got like a, um, a booklet or a pamphlet on creating better habits. Am I right? Yeah, I have an email on it and I'm also working on a, a shorter book for, for the topic as well. Okay. So when we were, before we went to record, I was telling you that, most family caregivers end up in their role because of an emergency. Most of us, 
this is this is all of us pretty much. I'm a little better than the average person, but that's not saying too much. We don't plan for needing care in our older years, you know, because we just we don't want to think about it. And we, you know, like I feel really good right now. I had a good workout this morning. I had good breakfast and lunch. You know, I'm like healthy, strong. My brain is good. Yeah, all's fine and well over here. But I don't know what it's going to be like in 30 years when I'm in my mid 80s. So, you know, I should probably plan for some of that. And we have talked about it. But, you know, for the most part, most people don't plan ahead for needing care or ending up with a disease like Alzheimer's or frontal temporal dementia, Parkinson's disease, which they don't really know what causes those. But I really have I have said this. And I truly believe that modern life is not great for our brains because, you know, there's a lot of pollution, a lot of cruddy food, a lot of noise. You know, we don't sleep well, a lot of stress, green, like pff, you just name it. There's just a lot of stuff we need to, to mo- you know, to um, moderate. I think that's the right word. Mod- not, yeah, you know, in, mo- in moderation. Yeah, I got the right word. It's, it's like. We're hitting the four o'clock hour when I'm usually having a snack. (laughs) So uh, my brain might slow down a smidgen, but anyway. So mm -hmm. one of the things that I see a lot with people that are caring for a parent, it, it happens when you're caring for a spouse, but I think the frustration level doesn't build up quite as fast because you're at the same stage of life as your spouse generally. But if you end up taking care of a parent, obviously you could still have kids at home or you could still have young adults, maybe in college, and you're still working on your career. You've got like some empty nest plans. You know, that's what that was going on in my life. It was like my daughter had finally moved out and then my dad passed away. And it was like, oh, no, no, no. I am not going to move mom into my house. I, for myself and for my mom, knew that that was a very bad idea. I knew we wouldn't make it a week. So, but we were very lucky because we had options that a lot of people don't have. So how can we help people who are just, they're exhausted, they're frustrated, they want their old life back? That's a good place to start. How do we help them move away from all of that anger, frustration, sadness, grief, irritation, all those negative emotions? Because we know those are not good for our brain. Obviously, you know, if we're a grumpy, unhappy caregiver, we're not nice to be around and the person we're taking care of can definitely pick up on all that. So we're just kind of adding to the problem. It's definitely, you know, you're in Florida, so it's definitely snowballs. (laughs) Not that you guys get too much snow over there, but how can we help people learn some, learn some better ways of maneuvering through their days so that maybe we can just at least help them dial down the, the, frustration and the aggravation, maybe, you know, 10%. Yeah. I would say two things just off the top of my head is if you make any of the day-to-day actions you have easier and also make it more satisfying for yourself. And by doing this, if you know that you're going to be leaving to the grocery store at a certain time, putting items that you might need next to the location that you're going to be leaving by kind of like preparing your area is probably the easiest way I could put it. So if you are going to be going on a trip, prepare your suitcase, prepare the items that you'll need, prepare, have a prepared list. You know, if, if you're a parent or someone that you're taking care of is at the point where they can't remember what they need. You have to be their memory support for them. And that would mean knowing what they need and making that easy for yourself. So if you're going into this position and situation, maybe even asking yourself, why am I getting frustrated? Well, and, and commonly what you can do with situations like that is you can start to pinpoint, okay, I'm frustrated because of this, but if you look at, okay, what can I do about that? Like, what can I work on? You know, I've had my own struggles of trying to get through this aggravation of, of all these stages. And what I would say is that if you just give yourself time to compensate for the frustration and you just keep focusing on, 
okay, how do I improve this situation? What can I do to make this better? How can I transition this to this point where my life will be slightly easier so that I'm not as mad about this or that, or the time it takes that, you know, maybe you're used to leaving in five minutes and now you have to take 30 minutes because you have to put on their shoes and you have to walk them out to the car and you have to sit them down and you have to buckle their seat. I mean, my grandmother, rest in peace, <laughs> you know, and you, it, it's hard because you love them so much, but you sit there and you, you're in this, like, just aggravation of like, why does it have to be like this? And to be honest, I'd have to say that the things you're frustrated about, like may never go away, but the thing to focus on is, okay, how do I improve it? How do I improve it? How do I make it easier? You know, is it, is it maybe, can I listen to some music while I'm doing this whole process? Is it maybe that I can listen to a podcast while I'm going through this? Can I listen to some educational material that'll, that'll give me better ideas and understandings of how to approach these situations so I'm not as frustrated? You know, can I learn some information on, on what they're actually going through so that I have an understanding of why they are acting like that? Things like that can help. And the second part is that when I'm talking about time, like we want instant gratification. You know, we want that microwave prepped, ready, done. I have, I have a result. It's immediate. And things like when we're getting into taking care of our, our family or, or someone who is at a state of need that can't take care of themselves anymore, and you've never done it before, realize that it might take you a couple years to really adjust, you know, and you're having to like, bet, like you said, you want to figure out how you can keep your, how do you get, how do I get my old life back? Um, it really depends on what you define as your old life, you know, and the best way you can integrate that back into yourself is just doing whatever actions you want to do, but just do it for a very shortened amount of time. Because if you're saying I'm missing something, I don't have something, it's because you're not able to do those actions anymore. But maybe that just means we have to slightly change what we were doing. Maybe you spent two hours doing your art. Maybe you can only do it for 10 minutes now. But in the very least, you're still able to do it. You just can't do it as much. So the way we want results is it's immediate and we can expect it and we can have it right now. But in reality, what happens is you need time and then you go through what you're going to go through this stage. You can call it the valley of depression. Um, but what I like to refer to it as it's like the seedling stage and a habit <laughs> because yeah, because you're, you're being put into this new area, this new realm, this new thing, of taking care of someone. And this isn't just applying to this subject, but applies to anything. If you're working out or if you're wanting to be someone who travels or something like that, or pick up podcasting or do anything, you're going to get into the seedling stage. And the seedling stage is very confusing and it's very hard and you can't grow very fast. You know, you're, you're needing the water and you need the, the sunshine and you need to show up every day. And that's really the key. And so, so as a tree or as a plant, you're getting through the seedling stage, things are dark and things are confusing. You're in the dirt thing. Nothing makes sense. Right. <laughs> and so you have, and, and the way that you start getting this sunlight and this water and this nourishment is just by showing up a little bit every day. And that can be hard because when you're being taken into this position of okay, I have to now take care of this parent full time. Like this totally changes my life. Just transition it to, okay, like I'm in the seedling stage. Things are confusing. Things are rocky. Things are hard. And you can look at it as we have seasons for different parts of our lives. You know, we have a season for, let's say being in production. We have a season for our career. We have our seasons for family. We have our seasons for our pleasurable activities that we like to do. And those will go in waves, you know, just like summer, spring, autumn, you know, and sometimes we get to spend more time doing those certain actions. And when we're looking at being in this position of this new position, you have to give yourself that time to show up on a regular day-to-day -day basis and show up the way you want to show up. You know, if you're making it to a point where you're saying, okay, I want my old life back. What does that mean? It means that I get to write or read or, um, do the career that I was working on, you know, like, okay, how do I find a solution 
to integrate that back into my life now that it's completely gone. Because in reality, we have 24 hours in a day. If you're spending all that time with your family, you know, you should be able to, in the very least, set aside five minutes for yourself. And if that five minutes means that you're doing five different activities within one minute timeframes, increments, so be it, you know, take, take what you can get. Um, I remember when I started working for a nonprofit 40 hours a week and had my full-time job 40 hours a week. And in addition to that, we would work on Saturday nights as well. And it's commonly Sunday night was the only time that I technically had off for myself, which was usually spent cooking, cleaning, and doing my laundry. So anyone who has this idea that this preconceived idea of like, I have no time, I totally get it. And you just have to, once again, just find different little pockets that take a break, take a 10 minute break and just go do something for yourself. You know, I I know that can be hard at times, but maybe you have someone that can just watch your parent for like five minutes or, or give them an activity that they can do. And then you can go run off. You know what I mean? And if, if you're getting to the point where it's like, well, that is just exhausting and frustrating. I don't know where I'm supposed to get the energy from that. Then I would start looking into getting different supplements that can help with the lack of energy, you know, go for a quick walk, do some breathing exercises, breathing exercises will give you energy and you doesn't cost anything to do them. (laughs) They don't take too much time either. Exactly. I find I, I've gotten really into a lot more breathing exercises and just, I'm trying to learn. I think I have a very low VO2 max. It's like when I ride my bike, I can, I can climb a hill. My legs don't scream at me. My lungs scream at me. My heart's pounding so hard. I feel like it's going to pop out my ears. I hate it. You know, (laughs) I'm working on it, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure physically I'm structured for that kind of activity, but I'm trying to learn structured breathing so that maybe I can climb a little bit better without feeling like I'm going to fall over <laughs> panting and heaving. Mm-hmm. It's just crazy. But yeah. Um, and it's amazing how when you slow down your breathing and you think about it, your whole body relaxes. So that is definitely a good suggestion. And mm. one of the things that I I see when I peruse social media, especially if I dive into the Facebook caregiving pages, the private groups, um, which are generally an older demographic. I think people need to understand that that you can use technology, like going to the grocery store. My husband right now has, um, a wound, an open wound on the bottom of his foot. And if he wants it to heal, which of course we do, he has to stay off of it, (laughs) which is very difficult because, you know, you can only use crutches and the little scooter thing before you're just kind of hopping around the house and, you know, he does not want to give up his workouts. His his trainer is working with him so that they're Mm -hmm. doing everything seated, I suppose. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm not diving into all that, but it's just, it takes longer to go to the damn grocery store with him. And he's on a cart with that's electric, you know, it's not like when I would go with my mom who walked behind me and walked really, really slowly. And you just wanted to like scoop her up and, zip her down the the aisle so you get in and get out oh, that just mm. that drove me crazy but when i mm. and i my mom when i started being when i was after my dad died and i was the person that was responsible for mom you know yes she was in memory care but that didn't that didn't lessen my responsibility it just lessened the amount of things i had to do on a daily basis but she was in much later stage Alzheimer's. So I stopped taking her to places that were overly stimulating because, you know, you may remember from, you know, your younger, younger years that that's a lot of input. They're bright. There's lots of color. There's a lot of stuff going on. There's just like, it's like getting pounded visually. And if your brain is not, you know, like super high level function, that's just too much. Like I took her to the fabric store cause she mm-hmm. loved to sew, loved mm-hmm. to do creative things. And she kept picking up stuff off the floor. And I'm like, Oh my God, this woman is picking up trash off the floor. I'm going to scream. And somebody pointed out, I was a guest point out. They're like, I don't know why you took her there, man. Those places are overwhelming. And I'm like, Oh yeah, duh. They're not overwhelming to me. I find them very mm-hmm. exciting, but mm-hmm. no mom for mom and people like my mom, 
totally overwhelming. So I, mm. you know, I always recommend just have people deliver your groceries. Mm. You know, most of the grocery stores have delivery service. And I, I keep trying to talk my husband into that, but he's old school. So it's not working. You know, and some people are like, oh, but I don't want other people picking out my produce. I'm like, Ugh, you know what? Pick your battles. Do you really think the customer service person is going to go through the cantaloupes, say, and pick out the yucky one? No, because you're going to stop using their service and then they're not going to have a job. So I never understood that. They're always, they're going to do their best to get you exactly what you want because that's their mm, job. Makes sense. Yeah. It's like, we just, sometimes we need to like reshift our focus from like, yeah, I like to go pick up my own, you know, fruits and veggies, but I don't want to do the rest of the grocery shopping. So I could either go to the local veggie stands, which we have lots of in California, or I can just suck it up and let somebody else do the grocery shopping, which if the hubby was off of his feet for longer than a month or two, probably would insist. But, you know, there's just lots of ways to get help that aren't necessarily hiring a caregiver to come in and wrangle your your person because that's expensive it's not always super reliable but there's just lots of there are lots of options when you are in a position to start thinking about them and putting them into place because obviously that's time and energy that people don't think they have uh oh <laughs> door slam <laughs> now the dogs are awake <laughs> oh my um fortunately they're quiet mm -hmm. What else do you suggest? How can we help people? Because I think one of the biggest challenges is, you know, you get into this, oh, pity me feeling. Like, one of my biggest challenges was I would get very angry at the world. Like, okay, yeah, my dad's gone. I can deal with that. But why can't my mom be hanging out with the grandkids and traveling and doing whatever home improvement decorating projects my dad always threw a hissy fit about. Like, why does it have to be this way? Urgh. Just was so, fr and it's like, that's so unproductive. I mean, it didn't help her. It made me feel terrible. And so I just had to like, whenever I felt that way, I just had to remind myself that, you know, I don't know why that this, this happened to her. And I may never know why. She always said, everything happens for a reason. And I always wanted to say, can you explain Alzheimer's to me then? Because <laughs> you know? she'd say that and it'd be just, oh, it would just push my buttons. But how can we help people move off of like those feelings? I just had to fight them and I just had to, to just, and, then, and this is not a strong suit of mine, is just basically accept that I did not know why. And maybe hopefully sometime in the next 50 years, I will find out why. <laughs> And if I don't, I have to be able to, I have to be fine with it. You know, I did start this podcast because I was looking for ways to be a better caregiver to my mom. Mm. She passed away much sooner than I expected. So, you know, I was like, oh, mm. I guess I could just keep doing the podcast because we were in the middle. <laughs> we're doing it anyway. <laughs> well, yeah, and it was like we were like, she died right at the start of the pandemic. So it was like, oh, wow. well, I got nothing else to do. So <laughs> might as well just keep going. And I've learned so much and it's like. Sometimes I see my little my little universe as they're starting to circle. They're going to come together mm -hmm. somewhere. I can feel mm -hmm. it. I can see it happening. Maybe I'll have my answer to why. But if not, I've learned that I just may not know. But how can we get other people to just, like, shift their feeling, their mood, their, you know, their attitude? Like, that sounds so negative, but... How can we just get people to accept, we may not understand all this, we may not like it, but it's important that we are as positive as possible because in, I, you said your grandmother, she had what, dementia? Pretty sure it was all, yeah, dementia or Alzheimer's. One okay. Other, it's pretty similar. Dementia is like a broad general term, like mm -hmm. infection, you know, it doesn't, mm -hmm. him, mm -hmm. it, you know what it means, but it's not a diagnosis. <laughs> um. They, they remember how you make them feel. Like my mom mm. knew I was her best friend that took her out and we did fun stuff. There was a day, so this was September of 2019. I had flown home from Denver. Anybody that's flown into or through Denver knows that that airport is always delayed. And we got home really late, early in the morning, which I am a, I am a solar person. 
If the sun is up, I am up. If the sun is down, I am asleep. <laughs> it's pretty simple. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm tired. And if I try to wrangle my mom out to the park to watch kids, which is what we always did, I was like, as soon as one little thing goes wrong, I think, you know, my my level of energy is not high enough to just roll with the challenges that getting her to her place of enjoyment would allow. So I so I had made the executive decision that we were going to stay in the care home. It actually happened to be my wedding anniversary. So I brought a chocolate treat because, you know, mm -hmm. we all love the chocolate. Brought mm -hmm. my wedding album, even though I knew she would not recognize one soul. I was just like, we got home at like one o'clock in the morning. I'm like, I'm just grasping for something entertaining to do with her. So she doesn't ask me the same question every two minutes. Mm -hmm. And I showed up and she said, oh, hi, where are we going? And I was like, what? the hell really yeah. like we've been doing this for you know two years two yeah. and a half years and now you remember we're going on like and now we're not going on oh my god i almost changed my mind but we had a really good afternoon despite the fact that we didn't go to the park to watch children so they really remember how you make them feel so if you are frustrated and angry and you want to scream at the world they're gonna know that and it's probably gonna make your caregiving more difficult so again, long story plus editing out noises. <laughs> How do we help people move from all this rage and frustration over this indignity that life has thrust upon them and their loved one and a little bit more acceptance? I know you had a really interesting podcast guest who had a severe brain injury and um, she learned how to find gratitude every day and that helped her a lot. So now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains. I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Yeah, that was more of a practiced thing. So she had such a bad head-on car wreck by a drunk driver that she couldn't listen to music for more than 30 seconds without having migraines for three days and constantly had to sleep and couldn't go back to work, couldn't remember things. And the sun was too bright for her to go outside. So she needs special glasses. And it was just her whole life got put on hold and she was going to school in college as a, uh, going to school for biology and did well at school. And so all of a sudden, just her whole life just stopped. And she was very upset about it. And it, it was so bad to the point where the drunk driver basically just got off the hook for hitting her too. And, and she didn't get so she didn't get so much mad about that. But when we're talking about like injustices and how it's frustrating and upsetting and things like that, gratitude is a learned skill, just like hatred is. You know, people don't grow up hating other nations or hating certain skin colors or hating certain people. They're taught how to do that. And when we get into situations, we can learn to hate the situation too. I know that personally, I went through a situation where I got wrapped into signing a contract that they didn't hold their end up of the bargain. And I had to stick it out for two years and I was very mad. 
about that entire thing. You know, it was one of those, like, I, I didn't, I was given false information about the, the whole ordeal. And then there were so many repercussions about quitting the contract that I just had to basically just bite and grind through it. And I was very mad about that for years, even after the whole thing stopped. Um, and so at times it's hard, you know, it's, it's hard to go through those things and it's hard to experience those things. And it's frustrating to have those things happen to you. And the thing to emphasize or to focus on or to dial into is to say, okay, what can I be grateful for about this situation? What am I learning from this situation? I'd say that's probably one of the best things because you can either win or learn, but if you're frustrated about losing and how you're at an effect of life, then that, that little mindset change between how I'm losing and how I'm being affected by life and in between to what am I learning and how am I winning at this can make the... 180% difference. Because if you're approaching a situation with the mindset to say, okay, what did I get? What little piece of information did I learn about to this day that still improves my life? You know, and to me, it's I'm I never sign or agree or am willing to say yes till I have all the information now. You know, that's part of the thing I learned. And honestly, like I, another example of this, I dislocated my arm 17 times, the same arm. It was the most pain I'd ever been through. And I've, I've had my leg run over before. And it's not like this is a light thing that I'm talking about. And honestly, dislocating my arm so many times really, really taught me like, you know, that if you just throw your body around and you make it a toy, then you, you can get some repercussions from that. And so it, it really helped me calm down as a person, but it really put me in the state of mind to say, okay, you know, going through that hard time, you know, either with the contract or with the dislocation of my arm, you know, I wake up and there's days where I'm just grateful that my arm doesn't pop out of place anymore. You know, seriously though, there, there, I'm, I'm grateful for the days that I don't have to be tied down to that contract anymore. There's, there's days where I'm just grateful that my commute is a 20 minute ride versus a two and a half hour drive, you know? So it's ironic that I'd be wearing this specific necklace, which is a, it has a little turtle on it and it has a yin and yang symbol on it because for for someone to see the the darker, harder, more difficult parts of a life enables you to understand how much joy and happiness you can have from what you have. You know, the that situation and and also is probably not going to go on forever. At some point in time, it's going to stop and you're going to get your life back to a different way, or you're going to be able to be more free from that situation. And in reality, and this is also like something I'm realizing is just take it as like, you know, one of those situations that happens to you and just tr do the best that you can through that situation in those hard moments of time. Because if you have that mindset of, okay, I'm going to show up and I'm going to do my best when life is really hard, then it's going to be so much easier for you to show up and be the best that you can be when you don't have this horrible hindering situation going on in your life. And not saying it is horrible hindering, but just to make the point that if you're if you're having a hard time with something and you're showing up the best that you can, when you're maybe not dealing with that hard thing anymore and you're showing up the best you can, that's when you start making those leaps and bounds. You know, that's how I was able to get over the 30 seconds of conversation that I forget. And now I'm making these leaps and bounds of I can isolate and figure out the confusion of the communication based off of one sentence or expression that they have, you know, and it was all of that time where I didn't get those instant results. I didn't get exactly what I wanted when I wanted it, but I, I went through and I showed up and I did my best every day. You know, there's a great example 
of this where if there it's a it's a picture of someone who is on a running track and they have crutches and a broken leg and they're on the running track and they're trying as hard as they can to like keep going there you know they're in the race and then there's three other people who are just lounging and they're laughing and they're having fun and on the quote it essentially says that you know if you're trying and you're showing up that you are doing so much more than the people who are not trying at all you're able yeah and and so when you're when you have the broken leg and you are trying you know just use that to your advantage see that you have actually a skill that can be used to your own benefit because even if you're 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 dealing with this broken leg thing right now but when the cast is healed and you're fully capable of walking again and running again you you can still use the same skill sets and go that much further than the people who just never tried at life you know that is true i know one thing that frustration especially when as a caregiver is generally from an an unrealized expectation mm. and you know when you're taking care of a parent you know you you want to do the best job in the world this is your mom this is your dad you know whatever or your grandmother you know you just you you want to you want to be perfect for them well that ain't going to happen and one mm -hmm. good thing with alzheimer's or dementia is as long as it's not <laughs> an hourly event, they probably won't remember if you screw things up occasionally. Yeah. And, the, you know, that was, that was, it was hard for me because my parents always seemed, it seemed like no matter what I did, it was never good enough. And I felt that way when I was dealing with my mom. But I also knew that it was like, but I'm doing everything I can. If there's something else I should do, nobody's told me what it is. So you know, I can't be expected to know everything. So I just, I had to give myself the praise that my mm. mom was unable to give because she didn't know that she should be giving it. You know, mm. this is not, this is not a knock on my mom by any stretch of the imagination. Mm -hmm. I mean, she had Alzheimer's mm -hmm. and she thought I was her best friend. She didn't, she didn't know that she had no idea what I was dealing with to help her. And so I just had to learn to, you know, give myself a little pat on the back and, you know, sometimes it was really hard and I'd leave the care home and I'd think, oh, geez, you know, this is, this is, this sucks. But it's like, but you know what? We made it. We did it today. She was happy. That's all that mattered. So that was my goal with mom was always to give her as much joy as possible and to give her the best quality of life as possible. And I've actually recently have started learning that I don't know how I managed to maintain my own sanity and do all the right things for moms. Like somehow I pulled it all together. <laughs> Maybe it's because I had lots of wonderful guests like yourself to talk to, <laughs> but you know, it was just like, you know, nobody gives you a, especially you get a diagnosis of Alzheimer's and doctors don't, you know, they don't say, okay, now here's the phone number for the Alzheimer's association. And these are the things that you should, you know, ask them. And, and here's the, you know, the resources are out there. They're just scattered all over the place. And we're still in the wild west of, you know, family caregiving. And unfortunately, you know, because this is a capitalistic society, which, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. I don't have anything against capitalism, but it's kind of run amok. But it's like when we when we as family caregivers are giving away billions, probably even trillions of dollars of free health care. And, you know, free daily care. Like, why the hell would anybody want to pick up that tab? Like, really? Mm. So it's, it'll, like I said, I'm, I'm seeing my little universes. They're all, they're circling each other now. They're all orbiting each other. One of these days is going to be a little big bang and the life for caregivers will be different. <laughs> I just hope that I remember these days. You know? uh. um, but it's, it's, you don't get a book. So you, you got to navigate the best you can and. I always did the best that I could to make sure that I stayed healthy because I knew if, mm. if there wasn't me to deal with mom, and this is very, very common. I mean, I did have a sister, but she had school aged children and her in-laws lived with her. So it's like, you know, for better or worse, I'm the oldest of the two. I always tried to handle things so that she didn't have to have that stress. I realized, I realized sometimes times that, that it seemed like, um, like maybe I was hiding stuff from her. I didn't do that, but I can see how it looked that way. But it's just, you know. So you're you saying there's, gotta, 
there's self-care involved with, oh, with taking you, care. Exactly. You have mm. to, you have to navigate your own care. Like the, I've seen so many caregivers when their person passes away, they're just devastated. And they're, then they're trying to figure out what pieces of my life am I putting together? How? Which is fine. I mean, we all go through this. A parent dies. It doesn't matter if you didn't have to take care of them. You still got to figure out how to put your life, you know, going forward, how it's going to change and how you're going to react to that. But with caregivers, when you've given up so much for so long, you know, all of a sudden now, poof, it's it's like instantaneous empty nest. Oh. And it's, it's a challenge. But, mm. you know, I, I kind of lost my train of thought. <laughs> I must need a snack. <laughs> yeah, you're but, good. But um, it's important to remember that, especially if you're taking care of um, a parent, that you are probably going to outlive them and you might want to be able to live past your caregiving time. So you, you really do have to focus on your needs just as much as theirs, which of course is like, feels like double the work. So mm. would you say that in your particular situation, did you plan for after having to be a caregiver as well? Um, sort of. I mean, okay. my dad, No, nobody ever talked to me about my dad's plan that my mom would just come to live with me. <laughs> it's like, well, thanks. That's not happening. <laughs> I just got thrown <laughs> in the bus. <laughs> yeah, for real. Like, yeah, the bus <laughs> ran over and then backed up. You know, it was like, and <laughs> because my dad was in the hospital for 32 days, so we bounced my mom from... She went from my house to my sister's house back to her home with, for a while, her sister would take, take care of her. My aunt is 11 years younger than my mom or was, and she also took care of their mom who had vascular dementia. So, you know, originally, and my sister and I agree on zero things. We actually agreed that we were going to talk to our aunt about um, moving into mom's house because my aunt took care of my grandmother and they lived on my grandmother's social security. I am not sure exactly how my family, you know, which is not, you know, we do not have a lot of stupid people in my family, but somehow we made a really stupid decision. My aunt was going to live on my grandmother's money. So when my grandmother died, guess what happened to my aunt? You know, my aunt has her own mental health issues mm. and, you know, so she's on welfare and subsidized housing. And so it was like, it seemed like a reasonable solution to move aunt in with mom she could take care of the household. We mm. would hire a caregiver to be there eight hours a day. Mm. Little did I know how difficult that probably would have ended up being. Mm. And, you know, it seemed, that seemed like a good plan going forward. And then there's me. I have a tendency to, to go down the dark side and be negative. And I started thinking all about the what ifs. Mm. And I realized I wasn't comfortable with most of the what ifs. Okay. Like if any of those what ifs happened, it was going to be a really big problem. Mm -hmm. so and i knew because mom like when mom and her dog were with me i knew how fast my frustration level shot up i also worked from home and i'm like i'm not i'm gonna have to hire a caregiver to deal with her so i can work this does not seem logical doesn't make sense right no so thankfully mom and dad's house was paid for we rented it out and we had a great family that rented the home that paid for most of mom's care home plus her social security plus money from the financial investments that they had that the financial and financial planner to guy, he dealt with those. So like mm. I said, we were very, very lucky, but I knew before my dad died that mom was, mm -mm, nope, the her, <laughs> my dogs hated her dog and I have golden retrievers. They don't hate anything and <laughs> they don't, <laughs> they're too, mm -hmm. too overly social. Aww. And I just, I'm like, this is not going to work. And it's like, I'm sorry, my daughter just moved out last month. I am not. Uh, uh. And I assumed that my mom was going to live for like 10 or 15 years. I'm like, I am not giving up an entire decade that I've worked my butt for to have like, just be me and the hubby and the dogs mm -hmm. and do stuff. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I immediately recognized that would have been a bad choice. A lot of people do not, they don't admit to themselves that like, this is not for me. Like I love my mom. I want the best for her, but it ain't coming from me. Mm -hmm. You know, because I don't think in, you know, I don't think our society really accepts that kind of quote attitude. You know, it's, it's, and it felt selfish to me, even though I had to manage 
the the tenants in mom's house and deal with mom's house and deal with mom and the care home and bleh. <laughs> you know mm. it wasn't like mom was in a care home and i didn't have to worry about anything that was that is not true the biggest difference between them living with you and them being in a care home is you aren't responsible for them imme- exactly 24/7 i mean you are but there's somebody there to help you mm. or you're you're the backup for the help basically but you can go back to being the spouse or the the you know the the child or whatever and that is a huge thing so mm. what yeah, would what you was, say mhm what would you say are some of the best things that you learned as being a caregiver like coming if there's like someone who is maybe listening to your episode that is saying oh i have to get prepared for this or maybe they're in the middle of it or maybe they're getting towards the end of it, this is essentially turning into three questions, but just bear with me. Um, <laughs> what what would you say, are there some overall tips or strategies or viewpoints that you would say, you know, I really did this and this is one thing that really helped me, or there is this thing I did at this stage, there's this thing I did at this stage, there's this, I'm sure there's a lot, you could probably write a book. <laughs> well, the best thing I did for myself was actually start a podcast. So I had actually people to talk to, okay. but it took me a while to actually accept some of what people were saying. Cause I would go see my mom once a week because mm-hmm. that is about all I could manage and still take care of all my other responsibilities. And trust me, I really tried to add a second day in, but there were day the weeks that I could have added the second day in Mondays would have been so hard that Tuesdays I was depressed. So I'm like, mm-hmm. there's no way I'm going on Thursday. Like I finally feel good on Wednesday, go Thursday, be depressed Friday. Yeah, no, I can't yeah. do that to myself. So I was mm-hmm. very honest with what I could do. Now, my sister did go on the weekends. My um, one uncle and the aunt did go. They didn't go weekly because they lived about 40 minutes away. But, you know, there was plenty of socialization for my mom. And while I wanted to do more and be able to do more, Mm -hmm. that wasn't an option. Mm -hmm. But it took me a long time to accept, way too long, to accept that going and being with her for two or two and a half hours was too much. Like Mm. there was one time we were there for two hours. I finally went to the ladies room. I came back and she went, Oh, hi, what are you doing here? And I thought, Oh hell, she don't remember any of the last two hours. I got zero credit for this. And and that made it even harder to leave because I'm like, I knew she didn't remember I'd been there all this time. It was like, why did I do this to myself? She didn't remember. So I started going, going and having shorter much more productive visits and not productive in as in we accomplished a bunch of things, but they were just more enjoyable for both of us. Oh, I see. And then she died about four months later. So like I said, I waited oh. way too long on that one. Um, okay. I had to really learn how to advocate for myself, especially with her doctors in the last year of her life. And we're kind of dealing with this now. And I know other caregivers deal with this, but like when you have like my husband's got, you know, the home health nurse coming in to deal with his foot wound. And they just assume that he's sitting around waiting for them to come. Like, oh, they're going to come. They're going to call you this evening to let you know what time tomorrow they're coming. Okay. Well, he's not home much on Tuesdays, even though he's not supposed to be driving. (laughs) He won't tell anybody that he drives basically with the cruise control and two feet, (laughs) but he has a meeting on Tuesday and, and he does things on Tuesdays. And so, you know, when he tells them, you know, I'm not necessarily available all day. And they act like that's some sort of really bizarre attitude. Like, <laughs> what? And what do I you see mean? That, yeah, it's like, what? Do you, I had a doctor call me and say, what was the doctor's staff? Well, because we were dealing with, with, the staff kept thinking mom was having UTIs and she wasn't. So they were trying to figure out what was going on. Fair enough. She went and saw the doctor. I took her to see the doctor, blah, blah, blah. They did some tests. And then it was one day I generally go out. I did before we moved, go out cycling with friends Wednesdays and Fridays. This was a Friday and I peeled off early because I'm like, I'm going to go home. I like, I got no recordings. I like no zoom. Nothing's I can shower. Just, Mm -hmm. I don't even have to put on makeup or dry my hair. Nothing. I can just be like, whatever. Mm -hmm. And you know, get some stuff done. Hmm. You should not have said that because karma came and smacked me upside the head. Uh-huh. <laughs> and the doctor's office called like 1130-ish. Hmm. And they said, the doctor would really like you to bring your mom back in today. 
Why? Oh, well, because, you know, they're trying to figure out, they want to schedule a, an ultrasound. Hmm. So you want me to drive to the next town, pick my mom up, drive back this way past my house to go to your office for what? What exactly does the doctor need to see her for? Mm. You know, like if he needs to actually reasoning. physically see her, great. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, and, and you could tell they were like, oh, why is she asking these questions? I don't have an answer to this <laughs> like, question. Why are you asking these questions? <laughs> well, yeah, I was like, and I said, because I'm not necessarily available today. Or I said, I, I said, I'm not available today. I said, if it's like, really super important i can like do my best but like you know this is not this is not a drop everything at lunchtime and just like wait i'm like I, and i remind him like she's got advanced alzheimer's like you don't just drop in on them and whisk them into the car and take them to the doctor unless you want to mm -hmm. fight and i don't right. no thank you <laughs> so long story short it was about literally 13 phone calls because every time i call the doctor's office i'd get the service and then the doctor would have to call me back and i uh, it was just a total nightmare. I'm like, why can't you people just call me and I call you back directly? It was so frustrating. Mm. I went, I had to take her 20 miles away to get an ultrasound. By the time I got all that done, I had learned a long time ago that screaming and yelling at people is generally not very beneficial. Mm -hmm. I lost my cool. I was yelling so loud. The windows were open. The neighbors could hear me and the houses wow. were that close together. I was because <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. like you people have trashed my entire afternoon and we're talking like four or five hours of time wow because you can't freaking give me a direct phone number to the doctor's office to handle this situation it's not like i'm going to call all the time mm -hmm. oh it was just terrible but i had to learn like don't just drop everything for the because then i would have gone to the doctor's office and then they would have had me running around other places so it would not mm -hmm. have been a better situation it would have actually been worse because I would have had my mom with me and she would have gotten pissed off, you know, and that actually happened in January of 2020. It took three of us to get her out of the office because she got mad at me mm -hmm. and I had to basically, you know, tell her that, yeah, everybody's assholes. Let's get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> she was not happy, but you just, mm. you have to learn how to advocate for yourself and mm -hmm. for your loved one and don't, Put up with other people's crap because you know your person best you know mm. yourself best so wow so you're kind yeah. of like being you're you really are being a caregiver at that point you're caring for them you're caring for you you're protecting them from other people in a sense and for yourself yeah. as well yeah because it's like you know that whole scenario i was so stressed out and i literally drove out of my neighborhood and i got literally trapped in the in the school traffic. Mm. And so I'm like, I'm not even going to try to turn left against all this traffic. I'm just going to go turn right, go back into my neighborhood and go out to a light where I can turn left on a stoplight. Mm. And there was this gal in this BMW. I'm like, I'm not driving like on the shoulder or anything. I really wanted to really, really wanted to, but I'm like, no, don't be one of those people. You know? <laughs> I was like, right. I have a legitimate excuse, but nobody else knows that. So just, just breathe. And just mm -hmm. follow this traffic till you get, you know, it was like two blocks till I could get back into the neighborhood and then wind my way through. Mm. And this gal decides to like, just like cut me off, block me from turning. Whoa. And I'm like, I wanted, she's lucky I didn't have a baseball bat or some lead pipe <laughs> in my car. I wanted to bash the crap out of her windows so bad. And I got sure back to the <laughs> stoplight and I'm like, just breathe. Just oh. like. <laughs> it was just like my phone rings in the car and it's um a gal i'm on a the alzheimer's association legislative advocacy team and it okay. was the team captain mm -hmm. and so i'm like oh god i don't know like, okay hi <laughs> blah, blah 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 and i'm like I'm gonna be nice and not blow her off too and my husband had found her phone number in my contacts and called her and said, my wife is about to come unglued and she has to go pick up her mom. Can you please call her? And she did. And she just, you know, oh. talked, talked me off the ledge. Uh. So that was probably <laughs> fall of 2019. Okay. We went to the state advocacy day in February of 2020. And as we were driving back home, she said, you know, for my mother-in-law, we had um, basically a concierge doctor 
And I'm mm. like, that's a thing? I thought that was just a TV show. She goes, no. She said, you know, it's not cheap, but you can afford it. You know, because she knew my mom had had enough money for her care. Uh -huh. I'm like, apparently I better listen. <laughs> so I, I did search around for a concierge doctor. At the time, they didn't super exist in the suburbs. That was February of 2020. We know what happened after that. So mm -hmm. my mom passed away. We had this pandemic thing. A lot of things have changed in those times. So, mm -hmm. you know, just you got to have your support in place. I don't know how I would have gotten through that afternoon without my husband, mm -hmm. without Pam, mm -hmm. without knowing that there were people out there who were dealing with the same crap that I was dealing with and and not murdering doctors and women in BMW. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like murder is not going to help the situation. Uh, <laughs> Probably going to make it a little worse. Don't do mm -hmm. it. It's not a good idea. You're not going right. to like jail. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, so it's just, it's like, and that's kind of how I dealt with it. It's like, I kind of used a little bit of morbid humor. It's just like, you know, going to jail for murder is probably worse than this situation right now. Mm, and then it was like. a comparison in a sense. Yeah, it was just like, I couldn't fix I mean, I guess, I don't know. I I wonder now if there was a way of not getting so frustrated. But it was it was just the absurdity of the entire, you know, like they would call and leave me a message and I would call back, but I, would, I wouldn't get them. I'd get the service. And then, you know, oh, God, it was mm, just such a, a joke. joke. Right. And I don't know why it was that bad. But, you know, it was just, it was stupid. I probably should have just refused and waited until the following week but it seemed like a really big deal they made it like a panic gotta do this right now and knowing what i know now i probably would have said okay well let's get that scheduled you know let's not panic and try to squeeze it in on a friday afternoon because that was stupid and you know i i guess it popped up to the top of their to-do list or something I don't know. but you know you really have to advocate for yourself and you have to protect your time and your emotions because if you're screaming at people and wanting to kill people in other cars <laughs> and you have to pick up your loved one how do you think they're gonna feel they're gonna be like why is this crazy person here i don't want to deal with them that is exactly what i got with my mom it took mm -hmm. every ounce that i had in me to just be like hi we're gonna go for a drive is that okay yeah. <laughs> oh here please drink all this water Please keep drinking this one. They want you to drink water. I know you're not going to do it, but just please try. Uh, so, yeah, it's just, it's really, really important to protect your own time and your own sanity and your own space or else you're going to be zero help to your loved one. Mm. That was a very long-winded answer to your one slash three questions. <laughs> <laughs> it works. Totally works. I don't think I've ever told that story on this podcast before. Mm. It's been a few episodes, so I'm not, sh I don't, I haven't told it in that much detail. I know that much for sure. So, okay. you know, but like I said, you know, I kind of used a little bit, I used what twisted little tiny bit of humor I could find in the situation. As mm. in, like I said, I would not enjoy jail. Any it, jail would not be any better than what I was dealing with. So <laughs> just suck it up. You know what? Mm. And then I just had the whole weekend to just like, just relax and have to worry about stuff. I could focus on other people and mom was fine. And yeah. So where can everybody find you on the internet and, and all your goodies? <laughs> Thanks for asking. <laughs> I would say over at iantolson.com would probably be the best place. That's where they can get the ebook and also listen to a couple of good podcast episodes. One with Jimmy Roenick, a guy who weighed 420 pounds and lost over 200 pounds. And then Taylor Mack, who recovered from a pretty, she lost her mother and she tells her story of how she recovered from it. And it's a really beautiful story. So that's over at iantolson.com. That'll just be my first name, last name.com. Would you be willing to put that in the show notes too? Or Oh yeah, definitely. I was just about to say, those will be in the episode notes. <laughs> Scroll down, click the link. There's also the episode with... Danielle Matthews. I keep trying to call her yeah. by somebody else's name today. She's wonderful. Yeah. If, um, that if was a good story too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If someone's really looking for a solution to help them with their, their health on a very fundamental level, then that's a great place to start. Yeah. Well, I hope this conversation was helpful to people that 
You know, sometimes we just need that little tidbit to be like, mm. you know, yeah, I've heard that 15 times. I guess I'm actually going to try it. <laughs> right. Like, no, like I was. People kept saying, you don't need to visit your mom for two and three hours. I'm like, but I only go once a week and here's all the excuses why you're wrong. <laughs> you know, they were right. <laughs> wow. Well, no, I mean, I think this helped me out in particular because like my mom's getting older. She's nowhere near at that point, but I think it would be get better to to plan and prep things out, you know, and talk with my brother who should also be in fair game with also having to take care of her as well. So yeah, I think this has really motivated me or at least brought me to the mindset of like, oh, you know, I should also prepare for this. There's something I need to do on this. So if anything, this really helped me out. So thank you. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Well, I have a great episode called Show Me the Money. It's how to talk to your parents about their finances. <laughs> yeah, okay. see, that's what everybody's like. Oh, I don't want to do that. But it also sure. tells you how to start talking to your children about mm. your finances. So if it's too late for, you know, people like me, to, I mean, I don't have to talk to my parents about their finances because mm -hmm. that's over. But we have had that conversation with the daughter. So, you know, we're okay. We're on that on that same track. And I will link some other episodes that help kind of start these conversations in the show notes. Okay. Because right now I'm having a brain fade on what the rest of them are. Just really terrible. <laughs> All good. So what happens when you have almost 300 episodes? It's like... <laughs> it's a lot I, of material. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's afternoon and I'm ready for my... My little snack, my little protein, fruit, iced tea. There you go. Kind of generate, or maybe I'll just start dinner early. We'll see what the husband wants. But <laughs> I really appreciate this. You guys should definitely check out Ian's podcast. I really enjoyed the story with Danielle. And I'm going to check out the two that he mentioned because I am an avid podcast listener, as you all know. And <laughs> thanks so much, Ian. This was a pleasure. And best of luck to you in all the things you're doing. Wonderful. Yeah. Thanks for having me on and I look forward to hearing this as well. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.